Hello guys, this is Paul McWhorter with TopTechBoy.com and we are here today live, live, live with Shop Talk number 31. I am going to need you guys to pour yourself a nice cup of hot black coffee. Ah, that is delicious. Yes, the weather has turned a little bit cool here in West Texas and so we have migrated for a time over to hot coffee as opposed to iced coffee. Main thing is it's black, no sugar, no sweeteners, none needed. Okay guys, what we are gonna talk about today is we are going to talk about integrated circuits and the history of integrated circuits. And I'm gonna see, it looks like we've got some people coming in. Uh, looks like we've got David uh, Thomas, we've got Safe, we've got the Jumbler, David, we've got Ron. Looks like we have a nice uh, a nice group of people coming in, and so we'll give people a second to uh, join us. We'll give people a second to join us, and then we will uh, jump right in here. Okay, looks like we've got the Green Diamond, Chris coming in. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Okay, what we are going to talk about today is we are going to talk about the history of the integrated circuit. And first of all, what is an integrated circuit? I can see by the comments a couple of you guys don't know what an integrated circuit is. An integrated circuit is the piece of silicon where all the magic happens. It's where the actual computation occurs. No, it's not the mother board it's the little chips that are on the motherboard that we are going to be talking about and kind of like the question I want to answer is <clears throat> If you think of something like these modern single board computers, a Jetson Nano has something like 2 billion, that's billion with a B, transistors, 2 billion transistors. The Jetson Xavier NX single board computer has 15 billion transistors on it. And how did we get to the point that we had just this absolutely unimaginable amount of computation power on our fingertips and I want to kind of take you through that and show you how we got to this point it wasn't like somebody just sat down and thought okay I want to make a single board computer that can do real-time facial recognition and all these different things and and I'm gonna go out and do that no it started very very simply and incremental steps were made along the way and there is no way when this thing got started that people could even dream of where it ended up. And so that's what I want to talk to you today about. Okay, Philippe says, good morning. Hey, Philippe, welcome. We've got Rowan. Welcome. Fun Engineering. Hey, always good to see you. Some of our regulars, Vignesh. Okay, Old Dog, Rainer 585. Okay, we've got a nice, uh, we got a nice little audience developing here. So let's talk about the integrated circuit. The integrated circuit is the piece of silicon. Hey, Philippe Lewis, we have a super chat. Thank you very much. Hey, just bought me a cup of coffee. Philippe, one of these days I'm going to be in an airport and think, I'd really like to have a cappuccino, and I think, ah, Philippe gave me a coffee. I think I'll go enjoy it now, so really appreciate that. Uh, really appreciate your help there, uh, Philippe. So we're going to be talking about an integrated circuit. An integrated circuit is the piece of silicon where all of the computation and all of the activity occurs. And like I was saying, modern integrated circuits can have up to 10 billion transistors on them. Now, in last, week, last week's episode, that was episode number 30, what I showed you was I showed you how an individual transistor works, right? The transistors are built on silicon wafers. They're built in integrated circuit clean rooms. And if you think of what's happening on the little integrated integrated circuit maybe the size of a postage stamp right this is the silicon wafer it has probably 400 integrated circuits on it and each integrated circuit could have a billion five billion ten billion transistors on it but kind of like what we talked about last week no matter what the integrated circuit is doing no matter what your single board computer is doing it all comes down to zeros and ones you're sitting up here on the Arduino and on the Arduino and you're writing code, but what the Arduino does is it changes all of that into zeros and ones. All numbers, all colors, all sounds, 
all videos, all pictures, all everything is represented as zeros and ones. Also, you can do math with zeros and ones. It's called binary. So you can turn everything into a binary number, and then you can add those binary numbers. You can subtract them. You can multiply them. You can divide them. You can do logical functions. And you do all those logical functions with little bitty switches. OK, so the zeros and ones all come down to little bitty switches. And so when we talk about the transistor, the thing that you have to see is, is that that transistor is a switch. The switch is either on. If it's on, it represents a 1, or it's off. If it's off, it represents a 0. So we know that all this complicated stuff all comes down to zeros and 1s. But when you get down to the hardware level, all those zeros and 1s are represented by little tiny switches which are called transistors, and those switches are either on or off. And the whole trick is how do you build, first of all, hundreds, and then thousands, and then millions, and now billions of these little transistors on a piece of silicon. Well, last week what I talked to you about was I kind of explained how an individual transistor works, how you do a little solid state physics. You get a single crystal silicon, and you can build in single crystal silicon a single transistor that is either on or off. Okay, But what we're going to be talking about today is how you kind of over time, how they figured out how to not just build one transistor, but to build bazillions and bazillions of them. Does this make sense kind of where I'm going? You know, we've got this incredible computation power. How did we get to where we are now? <clears throat> OK, D. Johnson says, how can letters be represented as binaries? Well, you can say that the number 1 is an A, the number 2 is a B, the number 3 is a C, the number 4 is a D, and then the number 1, 2, 3, 4 can be represented as a binary number. And so what you do is you have a number represent a letter, and then what you do is you just assign a different number to those letters. And so literally, same thing with colors. You can have red, green, blue. You can have strengths from two, 0 to 255. 255, I do believe, is like an 8-bit number. And so how strong your red is can be represented by a binary number. A JPEG image can be rows and columns of binary numbers. And so everything comes down to zeros and ones, and the zeros and ones are represented and manipulated with tiny transistors. But it didn't start out there. It actually started out, we're going to have to go back to the very earliest days of electronics. And this was before silicon, before the integrated circuit, before any of that. <clears throat> A couple of the very first electronic devices were radios, right? Where a person may be two-way radios, where one guy is talking to another guy, and that was the electronics. And radio electronics or radar electronics were based on devices that were called vacuum tubes. And I have one of those vacuum tubes here. You can see that it's very big and it's made of glass and it's got some elements inside of it. And inside this glass, it is a vacuum. And what those vacuum tubes acted like is they acted like amplifiers. And so if I talk into a microphone, it's a very small voltage signal coming off the microphone. I run it through some carefully designed uh, vacuum tubes, and then I got, get a big signal out that could like drive a speaker. So I could amplify my voice going from a microphone through a vacuum tube out to a speaker. Or I could create an electromagnetic wave and I could boost it up with, I could boost the power up with these vacuum tubes and then I could send that signal outside of, out on an antenna and I could transmit my voice over the air. All those early electronic devices were based on these vacuum tubes. And the vacuum tube was really designed around being an amplifier where it would amplify the signal coming in and have the signal going out be bigger. But what people also used them for is they used them as electronic switches because if you put a zero signal in, you would get a zero signal out. And if you put a positive signal in, you would get an on state. So you sort of had 
a lead that you could put high and the output would go high or you could put it low and the output would go low so with an electrical signal you could turn this switch on and off and these vacuum tubes therefore could be used as switches well some guys came along probably in the early 1900s and they said well we could represent everything with a zero and one and so if we had switches if we had electronic switches we could build computation machines we could build machines that would do computation now we have to do all of our computation in binary but we could actually solve math problems automatically with electronics if we had switches and they said okay well we could use a vacuum tube as a switch we could use a vacuum tube as a switch so there's always a lot of argument about what would be considered the first electronic computer. And anytime you try to say it, there's always going to be people that say, oh, no, that wasn't, but it was this. And, and, and so there's a lot of controversy. But in my mind, the first thing that I would actually really consider to be a digital electronic computer would be this machine and I will get out of your way but this machine is known as a Adenosov Berry computer and I'm sorry that I'm not saying Adenosov very well but the Adenosov Berry computer and it was the first electronic computer and it was made up of a whole bunch of these vacuum tubes the vacuum tubes were acting like on off switches and in fact it had 500 500 of these vacuum tubes and it could solve math problems now you couldn't just go in and write any program that you wanted. It was designed in hardware to solve a specific type of problem and that was it was designed to solve linear equations. And that would be like if you remember back in Algebra 2 you could solve one equation in one unknown or two equations in two unknowns or ten equations in ten unknowns. If you got up to ten equations in ten unknowns there's a lot of practical problems that might require you to do that but that took a lot of hand calculation and took a lot of time and so they designed this Adenasov Berry computer to solve linear equations now you didn't program it from a keyboard you actually programmed it by putting wires in and wiring it up in a certain way you would write the program by how you configured the hardware and it was designed for a very specific thing solving linear equations and how you ran the jumpers and how you ran the wires defined what specific set of linear linear equations that you were trying to solve so this was the very first what I would say digital computer came out in 1939 and it had 500 vacuum tubes well real quickly they wanted to solve harder problems well if you were going to solve a harder problem you needed more computation power that means you needed more what more vacuum tubes so the next kind of big computer development I would say was the computer that was called the Colossus okay and the Colossus machine had 1500 vacuum tubes and because of that it could solve more complicated problems it could solve more pro complicated math problems but like the Atanasov Berry computer the Colossus was designed for a specific type of problem and this was made in 1945 towards the end of World War II and back then the whole big issue fate of the Western world depended on code breaking right cryptography could you take a encoded message from the uh, from the enemy and could you decode it could you crack the code and that took a lot of computation and a lot of trial and error and a whole bunch of people trying a bunch of different things to crack a code well they thought a computer a digital computer can work a lot of different problems very quickly and so let's make a code breaking machine and that's pretty much what the Colossus was it was designed to try to decode or crack enemy encrypted messages and it was actually quite effective at it because they understood code breaking it just 
just took them too long to do it by hand. And so they created this machine that could break codes. But why do I consider it a digital computer? Because it was using on-off switches, vacuum tubes, and it was doing everything digitally. It was doing everything as a digital type of computation. And so that is how we got to the Colossus. It was a Colossus of a machine, and it was kind of useful, but it was very, very limited, very, very specific in what it could do. Okay, so then what we uh, went to is if you want a more general purpose computer and you want to even solve more general problems, you need what? you need more vacuum tubes. And so this would be kind of like what a lot of people consider to be the first general purpose digital computer. And this is the ENIAC. Okay, the ENIAC. And the ENIAC came out in 1946. And the ENIAC had about 18,000 vacuum tubes. 18 thousand vacuum tubes but just like the earlier ones you programmed it by going over and plugging in wires you would plug in and plug in kind of like the old telephone switchboard operators you would connect these logic gates these logic gates that were based on <clears throat> vacuum tubes you would connect them with these wires and if you connected everything upright you could have this digital computer solve a problem for you well the specific problem while this was the ENIAC was a more general purpose machine the specific problem that they were trying to create was to create these artillery uh, firing tables okay because a very big thing in war is artillery and how accurately can you fire your artillery well there's actually physics equations that said if you're using this shell and your barrel is this long and you aim it at this angle the artillery round will go this far and so what they used to do is they used to have rooms and rooms and rooms and rooms of people who were called tabulators and they would sit and do math all day long and say okay if the uh, shell is this size and the gun barrel is this long and you have this much powder and you have this angle then it's going to fire this far okay now let's have a little more powder let's have a little more powder so they had these incredibly complex tables that turned into these huge books that if you want to hit someone this far away you would look it up in the book and then you would sort of look up the answer and then that would tell you the elevation that you needed to have your gun bore at in order to hit your target and so it's kind of a mundane thing now but it was really important back then because the guy that could fire the most accurate you know it's not whose who's, uh, artillery can shoot the furthest or has the biggest explosion it's who can put it on target the most accurate so these these uh, artillery tables were very very important but they were incredibly time consuming to do so the ENIAC brought together 18,000 of these vacuum tubes and made a computer that could very quickly do these calculations. And what, what you could do is 30 seconds on the ENIAC could do the equivalent of 20 hours of work. So a problem that would take one man 20 hours, and that's kind of like two days, what would take a man two days to do, they could do 30 sec in 30 seconds on the ENIAC. And so, and also the ENIAC can be more, more accurate because, you know, the human can make a mistake and the ENIAC wouldn't. And in fact, if you're firing artillery shells, you can't afford to make a mistake. So typically what they would do is they would put one guy in one room and they would put another guy in another room and they would give them both the same problem. And if after however many hours, five hours, this guy got an answer, this guy got an answer, if it was the same answer, they'd say, well, it's got to be right because if you made a mistake, you know, just statistically, you wouldn't make the same mistake. So if they got the same answer, then they would say, okay, that's right. If they got different answers, they would say, one of them made a mistake they would go to a third person he would work the problem and he would kind of be the tiebreaker of who of the first two guys got the right answer so you can see that was incredibly time consuming and incredibly tedious and so to have this ENIAC that was a huge big deal that was a huge step forward to be able to have a machine make those calculations to create those artillery firing tables all right so you can see that we've already, from about 
1939 to 1946, we've made huge progress from where we went to a vacuum tube being used as a radio to it made a simple computer with 500 switches to a more complicated computer with 1,500 switches to a really complicated computer with 18,000 switches. So you would say, okay, let's keep going. But you kind of reached a point with the ENIAC that you couldn't go any further. I want you to think of 18,000 of these. Each one of these draws a huge amount of power, somewhere between 100 watts and 1,000 watts. That is a huge amount of power to be drawing. Now, if you've got three or four because you have a radio amplifier, that's not a big deal. But at the point that you had 18,000 of these, can you imagine how much power? You would have to call the power station and tell them that you're going to turn this computer on because it's going to drag their system down. And you'd have to have special cabling bringing all that power in. And so it used an incredible amount of power. Also, you could imagine each one of these vacuum tubes was very expensive. So if you had 18,000 of them, that was incredibly expensive to build it. Now, you think of how much it costs to operate it because you've got 18,000 of these and you're using a lot of power. But I also want you to think that if you put, like imagine this is kind of like a toaster oven, you know, it, like power-wise about like a toaster oven. In fact, I've seen people make toast by putting it near one of these things. If you had 18,000 toaster ovens in a room and operating them full out, what is that going to do? That's going to heat up the room. So not only are you paying for the power to run the computer, you have to have huge air conditioning units to keep the room from overheating. So you got to power, you got to pay for the power to run the vacuum tubes, and then you got to pay even more than to cool the room back down. Okay, but it was kind of uh, doable. They did, they were able to make these uh, these artillery tables. But the other problem is these things don't last forever. They actually burn out kind of regularly. And so if you have 18,000 of them, pretty much every time you tried to run a program, one of these things was going to go out. Now the problem is you got 18,000 of them and you don't know which one ran, well, which one went out. And so you crank your computer up, you run your computer program for about two hours and then the thing crashes because one of your vacuum tubes has gone out. And then you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to go in and you're going to have to figure out which one of those 18,000 vacuum tubes, which one went wrong. You're going to have to pull that shelf out and then trade it. And then put a new one in and then you're gonna have to crank your computer up again and it's gonna run another two hours and then a different vacuum tube is gonna go out so literally these computers would have hardware failures about once a day or at least every day or so but still it's better than having hundreds or thousands of people sitting there tabulating by hand so it was working well enough that it really worked but what you can see is is that you could not go the next step and say, okay, for the next level of computation, I am going to build a computer that has 180,000 of these things. You just reached the point that it simply was not practical. And so this ENIAC was probably the most advanced digital computer that would be possible using vacuum tubes. Okay, so then we had what would be a real breakthrough. And that real breakthrough happened in 1948. And it's really probably just an incredible, like talk about changing the world and changing the universe. It was a discovery or an invention made by these three gentlemen. We have John Bardeen, we have William Shockley, who is sitting down, and we have Walter Bratton. Okay, and in 1948, they figured out how to make a solid state switch. And that switch was called a transistor, where on a little piece of germanium, a little single crystal germanium, or on a little piece of single crystal silicon, they could build this on-off switch. Three leads. If you take the the middle lead high, it turns the switch on. If you take the middle lead low, it turns the switch off. And so that that switching function that I described to you last week, that that is the heart 
of all digital computers, they figured out how to do something that instead of being this big could be done in something that was minusculely small, like let's say the first one, something close to the size of a grain of rice. So you take something like this and you replace it with something the size of the grain of rice. Also, these transistors were low power. So they didn't take a lot of power. And because they didn't take a lot of power, they didn't heat up. And also the tr transistor, because it was a solid state device, it was switching using electrons inside of a crystal. There were no moving parts, nothing to heat up, nothing to wear out. So if you built a computer based on these little silicon or germanium transistors, you've got something that is going to be reliable, isn't going to break down, and you could start doing really much more general purpose computation. <coughs> So that takes us to about 1955, where it took them a while. They demonstrated that they had a little switch, but it took them a little while to get a practical switch and where they could make the practical switches and then they could wire them up to be a digital computer. And kind of what I would consider the first digital computer was this Tradic or Tradic, this Tradic computer. And the Tradic computer was made in 1955 and it was the first uh, it was the first solid state computer, the first computer that got rid of the vacuum tubes and used these tiny little silicon transistors, silicon transistors about the size of let's say a grain of rice. And with this, because the transistors didn't use a lot of power and because they didn't burn out, you could make computers that, uh, that had tens of thousands of transistors and you could run them a long period of time because they weren't heating up, there was no moving parts, they wouldn't burn out. And so the Tradic or Tradic could be considered the first, I think, sort of like general computer, the first general purpose computer, it was capable of doing millions of operations per second, millions of calculations per second, and the whole thing drew like 100 watts. Like an old style light bulb is 60 watts, and so now you've got a computer that draws about like one light bulb, and it's not something that fills up a whole room. And in fact, they use these trade computers, they were able to put them on B52, Twos, and all of a sudden the B-52 was able to start doing computation on board for things like navigation or getting bombs more accurately over the, the target. They actually had a general purpose computer inside of the airplane. The Tradic also could solve more generic math problems. It wasn't designed around a specific problem like artillery tables or encryption or decryption or solving linear equations. You could solve more general equations. Okay, so now at this point, you might think we've got the transistor just make computers with huge number of transistors. But at that point, what really became the limitation <clears throat> was interconnecting all of these transistors together. So imagine if you had this bucket with 50,000 transistors in it and you're putting them on a board and you're soldering them, that's a bunch of wire, okay? That's a whole bunch of wire and each one of those solder joints could be a failure point. And so all of a sudden, the thing in the days of the Tradic that limited how complicated an integrated circuit could be, it came down to the problem of the interconnect that you just can't reliably run that many wires, that you're going to end up with a bad solder joint, a bad connection, or the wire is going to break. But, you know, the, the Tradic really was a very huge step forward, and it was a huge step forward in having something that began to be what you would consider a modern computation device. Okay. So now... How did we go from being limited to tens of thousands of switches or transistors? And with that, you would have something that would be kind of like a desktop calculator, you know, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and maybe kind of program those steps together, but relatively simple. How did we go that from that to something like the Jetson Nano or the Jetson Xavier NX that has billions? 
because you might get tens of thousands, you might get hundreds of thousands by wiring, or you might get tens of thousands, or kind of like at the extreme of your imagination, you might have a computer with 100,000 transistors. But how did you go from that to millions and then billions? All right. What that was, was that was a brilliant idea, and I will probably make people mad because there was, uh, you know, Kirby and some other guys that were working on it. But the guy that I would say was the first guy to really invent the integrated circuit was Robert Noyce. Okay, and here is Robert Noyce. I'll get further out of your way. And what he's got in his hand here, that is not the first integrated circuit. That's like a picture of the design. The integrated circuit would be very, very small, but it's a blow up of kind of like the design. And what he did was, rather than building individual transistors and then wiring them together by hand, he said, let's just build all the transistors at the same time on a piece of silicon and then let's interconnect them on the wafer and so he used lithography processes to where he sort of flashed the metal on the surface of the wafer where the metallization was done all in one step and all the interconnect was done at the same time so all of a sudden you kind of batch fabricated the whole CPU, you batch fabricated the whole computer at the same time on a piece of silicon. And not only, like remember I said on this one there's probably 400 integrated circuits. You don't just build one integrated circuit, you build them all, you build all the transistors and all of the integrated circuits in parallel at the same time and therefore the cost goes way down. So all of a sudden now we get to something that is just mind-blowing because you're building all the transistors at the same time, you're building all the integrated circuits at the same time and after you're done with the wafer you just saw it up and you get one and you put it in a little package and then it becomes your Arduino or it becomes your Jetson Nano. So really, it was just this incredible breakthrough when Robert Noyce had the idea of building everything batch style in parallel at the same time. And so I would consider Robert Noyce to be the father of the modern integrated circuit. And he kind of did the first demonstration in 1958-1959. Okay, so you say we're off to the races. Now all you got to do is just go in and put more and more transistors. You're building them at the same time. So build more and more and more of them on a computer chip or on an integrated circuit to get more and more and more powerful computers. You would think that, okay, you would think that, but let me tell you what the problem there is. Really quickly they had the concept like let's just keep making the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller and let's keep packing more and more and more onto this chunk of silicon to get more and more and more powerful computation. But this is the problem. If you think about this room that we are in, there is dust in the air and there is an incredible amount of dust in the air. And when you're trying to build an integrated circuit <clears throat> and you're building small transistors, on a transistor scale, one of those little particles of dust in the air that you cannot even see, you cannot perceive, would be like a boulder on the scale of the integrated circuit. So it would be like imagine getting a bucket of gravel and going out and throwing it in the transmission on your car. It's going to wreck your car. Well the same thing with these solid state transistors that if during fabrication one speck of dust hits one transistor that transistor doesn't work and if that transistor doesn't work the entire integrated circuit doesn't work. So what they were able to do is they, they would go in and they would try to make the room as clean as they could. So imagine we totally sealed this room in and we had huge fans going with filters and we have these filters that will take out every particle and we just are running a huge amount of air through those filters. <clears throat> but what they found is no matter how big the fan, no matter how good the filter, no matter how quickly they were running that room air through those filters, they still had too many particles in the room and those particles would find themselves onto an integrated circuit. And again, if one transistor doesn't work, 
the whole integrated circuit doesn't work. So let's say that we have an integrated circuit, a small integrated circuit, and it has a hundred transistors on it. And uh, this transistor doesn't work, that whole circuit is bad. Now we go to the next circuit, it was this transistor that didn't work, that whole circuit is bad. Then this one, this transistor bad. So if 99 out of a hundred transistors work, that means none of your integrated circuits work. And so they were kind of limited. It was just like this incredible enabler that they figured out to build all the transistors at the same time on a piece of silicon or a piece of germanium. But the problem was that the room wasn't clean enough and a tiny speck of dust would cause the entire circuit to not work because one malfunctioning transistor means the whole circuit doesn't work. And so they were limited to a small number of transistors and simple things like maybe a NAND gate or a NOR gate. That was the level of integration that they could get because they couldn't get the room clean enough. And the darn problem that they were having is, again, no matter how many fans and how many filters and no matter matter what, they could not get the dust out of the air. It's just like they'd filter, 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 and then go, look, there's still dust in the air. Well, that was because, and this then comes down to what I consider to be the greatest invention of the 20th century, the greatest invention of the 1900s was what was called the laminar flow clean room. And the, this is the very first laminar flow clean room. This is Willis Whitfield there sticking his head out of the first laminar flow clean room. And he is the man that invented it. And this is what he realized is he realized that you could never clean a room by filtering it if you had turbulent airflow. And turbulent airflow is the normal airflow that you have when you have a fan. So what that means is if I have a fan pushing this way, you end up with these swirls of air that sit and just circulate. So even though some air makes it over to the filter, you've got these other kind of like currents, these circulating currents of turbulence, and the particles get in there and just circulate, and they never get over to the filter. And that is the normal airflow. It is called turbulent airflow, and it is what you get by default. And because of that, you could never get a room clean. Well, what he said is, is that, and he's like a really smart physicist, and he says what we need is we need laminar flow. We need laminar flow. And what laminar flow, and that's what this was considered up here, the first laminar flow clean room. And laminar flow means that the air comes in, it goes across, and it goes out the filter. And nowhere does it start circulating. It just go whoosh clean, clean, clean flow, and no, none of these little eddies developing in the room. So he realized the way you wanted to do that was to design the room very mindfully. And this is in the inside, again, this is Willis Whitfield, and this is inside of his first laminar flow clean room. So what he did was on the outside of the room, he had the fan, and then very carefully and smoothly, he brought the airflow up and then it comes down through carefully designed grates in the ceiling that have all these little holes and then the air comes straight down and then if you look in the bottom in the floor there's all these little holes in the floor and it just goes through those holes in the floor so the air comes in through the ceiling, straight down, and then out through the floor. I always wonder why they go from ceiling to floor. Maybe it's because gravity helps. You know, you've got gravity going your way, but then it just sucks all the dirty particles in the air out through the floor. And then underneath the floor, that's where you had all of your filters. And then all of those filters would filter the dust, and then you would come back, and then you have cleaner air this time through coming in, but there's still some particles, and then it comes and then it cleans it again, and it just keeps circulating the same air. So you're not bringing in air from the outside, you're just constantly circulating the air that is inside. And each minute you turn over a huge volume of the air and the air gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. This, my friend, 
<coughs> is what enabled the modern integrated circuit. And this is probably, I would consider, as big or bigger of an invention than Shockley's invention of the transistor transistor itself. Uh, Willis Whitfield actually worked at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, I actually was able to meet him. He was finishing up his career at Sandia about the time that I was starting my career at Sandia. And so I had a little inter I had a little bit of an overlap with Willis Whitfield, but he's probably one of the most underappreciated and underremembered and under uh, respected people in the world because if there was like kind of like one man that really enabled the modern microelectronic revolution, the modern, you know, kind of like changed the world drastically that the integrated circuit and the computer chip did. The man that really enabled that was the man that figured out how to allow you to make a room clean enough to make these uh, these modern integrated circuits. And this got started in the 60s. That's why we started seeing things like calculators very quickly, like the Texas Instrument calculators. And, and all of a sudden, the electronic components came into your home. I don't know if you remember those little TI watches they came out with, the TI calculators. Kind of in the late 60s and early 70s, you started beginning to see integrated circuit devices as commercial products because of the invention of the laminar flow clean room allowed you to build integrated circuits complicated enough to build low-cost practical things for uh, for home users <coughs> and so the interesting thing is what Willis Whitfield invented in this laminar flow clean room, it is exactly the same physics and exactly the same principles that are used in modern integrated circuits, uh, fabrication facilities. So if you go to an Intel integrated circuit facility or NVIDIA or whoever, it is this exact thing that Willis Whitfield invented that is being used in those facilities today. And so I think that that is just super cool and we tip our hat to Willis Whitfield for one of the most important and innovative discoveries and inventions of the last couple hundred years. So that is his little clean room. I think it's Sandia. Sandia had dismantled this at some point because I think they didn't even at the time fully realize how important the integrated circuit was going to be and how important his invention was going to be. But then we go from that to a modern integrated circuit manifest manufacturing facility. And this facility is actually the kind of pink building here. This is a modern uh, integrated circuit manufacturing facility. I actually managed this facility back when I was at Sandia National Laboratories. I was the deputy director for microsystems and I managed their integrated circuit manufacturing facilities. And uh, you can see the uh, you can see the facility there. Uh, and I think I can scoot up here. This was actually actually my office right here, this round, this curved section that was coming out, that was my office. And this, this uh, wing of the building that is towards me, that was office space. But then back on the other side, you see another wing of the building that have those tubes coming out. That was the integrated circuit manufacturing facility. And I can kind of show you those tubes, what those tubes were is, that was the air circulation tubes. And so that is how you got the air coming from the filters in the basement back up and then through the filters in the ceiling and then top to bottom through the clean room. And you can see that there were many, many, many huge tubes. And I can show you a close up of those tubes. That's actually me back in my younger days in the kind of aqua shirt. And these were some of the guys that I worked with in the uh, in the facility. And then you can see behind us there are those enormous air handling tubes that were used to keep the air clean inside of the integrated circuit manufacturing facility. And uh, like I said, I sort of overlap there with Willis Whitfield. It's kind of like we realized, hey, the guy that invented this, the guy that enabled the entire microelectronics revolution, works here at Sandia, and so we had him come over. This is Mr. Willis Whitfield in his er, in his later years, and that there he is inside of kind of Sandia's latest and greatest integrated circuit manufacturing facility. And he came over, and we kind of honored him, and he had his picture taken in front of the clean room. 
Now, where he is, he is outside the clean room. Between him and that equipment inside where it's orange, there is a glass wall. So he is not inside the clean room. You could never wear street clothes inside of a clean room. It's quite complicated to get gowned up and to actually go inside of the clean room. But you can walk around the outside and you can look through uh you can look through windows. Well, you see there's some doors there. You would never go in and out of that door, and it's positive pressure inside of the clean room. So the air is at a positive pressure. So if there's any little seam or crack in a door, the air is always escaping. There's never outside air that enters the... Hey, we got a super chat from Claudio. Wow, thank you very much, sir. We really do appreciate that. Really appreciate that. But it's positive, so there's no way for our, uh, our filthy, dirty air on the outside to get into the clean room. To actually go in there, you've got to go through quite a gowning uh, process. Now, you see it's orange inside of the clean room. Why is it orange? Because it, the way you build integrated circuits is it's a photolithography process. It's kind of like the old dark rooms. And remember in the old dark rooms, you couldn't have light because it would expose the paper. Well, it's the same thing in the clean room. Those are like orange lights so that you don't expose the photo resist you don't expose the photolithography process and so that light is at a frequency that that photosensitive material will not respond to and so this particular bay is like a great big dark room and that's where you photo define those very small features that are going to become the transistors but you can walk around on the outside and you can look through the windows all you want well actually this was inside of like a very very secure area so you couldn't just walk in and look at it uh, uh, you know off the street but if you work there you could go in and you could look in and see what the people were doing inside of the uh, facility and so this would be kind of like what you're looking at is one bay of the clean room there would probably be like 22 of these that do different uh, processes to make a modern integrated circuit so again this is a silicon wafer it has 400 integrated circuits on it they're all built at the same time you build these 20 wafers at a time each integrated circuit might have a billion transistors on it and then you build 20 of these wafers at a time and to build the modern integrated circuit it's like 400 steps and so if you're going to do this you got to kind of have a run sheet and you've got to define exactly each one of those 400 steps put it in the computer start with uh, 20 of these blank wafers and then to go through those 400 steps might take three or four weeks and so you define it you start the wafers on one end of the facility and then two three four weeks later you get your completed wafers out with your integrated circuits on them and so they are built inside of these facilities but I just think that is a great picture of the one the only Mr. Willis Whitfield uh, Willis died I think in 2012 man I wish he was still around and that I could call him up for a live chat and sort of get his uh, his perspective on things. But the real great ones, like the guys that invented the transistor, the guys that invented the integrated circuit, the guys that invented the clean room, they're all pretty much gone at this point. I sort of think I entered at, inter, interacted with Gordon Moore a couple of times in my career. Again, his career was ending as my career was getting, uh, getting started. <clears throat> but I did get a chance to know some of the great ones. And actually... Uh, kind of like there was a lot of innovation that occurred at Sandia in the development of the integrated circuit. One, of course, was the development of the laminar flow clean room. And another was that it was really CMOS that is what all of the modern integrated circuits are built out of. That was invented at Sandia. Because remember, I showed you how you could have PMOS transistors, which operate on hole conduction, or NMOS transistors, which operate on electron conduction. And you can build computers around those. But the problem is, is that when you switch them on, they draw current. And if you have a whole bunch of them, like at the point you start getting to millions of transistors, you're using a lot of power because all your on transistors are drawing current. Well, in the early days of computer chips, <clears throat> we needed to put computer chips in space. 
And the problem is in space, you have very, very limited power. And therefore, we needed a way to make integrated circuits that were very, very low powered. So a guy at Sandia had an idea. Instead of using P-channel or N-channel transistors, let's put a P-channel in series with an N-channel transistor. And that way, when this one's on, this one's off. And when this one's on, this one's off. And therefore, you can do the logic functions, but they ne never actually draw current. That CMOS was invented in order to be able to put computer chips and to put CPUs into space. And it was invented by people that I worked with in my early years at Sandia National Laboratories. The other thing that was the big deal about Sandia is normal integrated circuits will die if they see radiation. That an integrated circuit is even more susceptible to radiation damage than a human. So if you were sitting there with an integrated circuit as a human and got some level of radiation exposure, the integrated circuit would actually die before the human would. And so what we developed at Sandia National Laboratories was a way to radiation harden the integrated circuits. And that's what I spent my early years at Sandia on was developing those hardening techniques to be able to create integrated circuits that were more impervious to high levels of radiation. So you could use them in things like, oh, say, nuclear weapons or things that were going to go into space like satellites. And so that was some of the cool stuff that I got to work on in my early days at, uh, at Sandia. And so there we've got Mr. Willis Whitfield in front of Sandia's latest and greatest. We actually put a statue out in front of the new facility of Mr. Whitfield. <coughs> And this was him very much in his uh, later years. This was probably a couple of years before he died, but we got his picture there with the statue of him. The statue was more of him as a younger man. It would have been something more like what he looked like there. I think you can see the resemblance to that picture a little bit uh, a little bit better but now you've just got incredible advancements and kind of like the whole game of integrated circuits now is to make the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller because the smaller you make the transistor the more that you can pack on an integrated circuit and the more computation the integrated circuit can do where you're going from millions of operations a second to tens of millions of operations a second to hundreds of billions of operations a second to billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions, trillions. And now, like the Jetson Xavier NX can do 21 trillion mathematical operations per second. Well, how did that happen? We got to keep making the transistor smaller, smaller, smaller packing more of them onto an integrated circuit. Well, now, one of the things you got to do is you make the transistor smaller. You've got to make the clean rooms cleaner and cleaner and cleaner because they constantly then become susceptible to ever smaller dust particles. So it's a game of making transistors smaller, making clean room cleaner, and packing more and more transistors onto the integrated circuits. And you guys have probably heard of Moore's Law, where back in the 70s, uh, Gordon Moore said that you could double the computation power every 18 months. <coughs> and the industry was able to keep up with his most aggressive projection for many, many, many decades. And so that's kind of how things have been going. One of the things here, this is, uh, uh, a young lady that is working inside the clean room. You can see that if you work inside the clean room, you can't wear street clothes. You have to wear these bubble suits. It kind of looks like a hazmat suit. You see she's got a bubble over her face. These are kind of affectionately known as bunny suits. I don't know why because everyone, it doesn't have any inappropriate connotation. It just looks, every everyone looks like a white bunny with them on. And it's kind of hard to recognize people because they've got all identical clothing on. But in order to go in the clean room, it's quite a process and you've got to get gowned up. And so the first thing you do is when you walk into the outer area, there's a machine you put your feet in and it scrubs your shoes. And then you open a door and then there's a little compartment about the size of a phone booth, if you remember what a phone booth is. You walk in, you close the door behind you, and it's an air shower. It just blasts you with air, and there's like nozzles all the way up and down, and you've got to stand there, and it just blasts the most obvious dirt off of you or 
particulates off of you and then you open the other door but these two doors can't be opened at the same time this one opens you go in it closes you get blown off and then this one opens and then you go in you're not in the cleaning room yet you're just in the gowning area so now you go and uh, you have like a place for privacy but you take your street clothes off and you put on kind of like pajamas kind of like undergarments they would be something like what a nurse wears like nurse scrubs they're comfortable but they're not normal nurse scrubs they're like a special material that does not give off any lint or give off any particulate like it's a zero shed material that doesn't shed any particulates okay so now you're pretty clean with that on then you go into another air shower open this go in close it take an air shower now open this one now you're in a cleaner compartment and in there you put on this white bunny suit and you've got a completely cover all exposed skin this is not to protect you from chemicals in there this is to protect the environment from you because if you breathed out you would just shed all types of particulates into the air and so you can see the young lady has a bubble over her face there's tubes that come out of that let's see if this will show the tubes here yeah you can see the tube coming out of the back there that is goes down to a little filter pack a battery operated filter pack on the hip and it is filtering the air that you breathe out you're breathing clean room air in to this hood and then what you exhale goes through the filter pack on your hip <coughs> and that th therefore none of your skin nothing from you because on clean room standards humans are very very filthy you just shed you shed you shed particulates and so you've got to have humans in there but you've got to protect them okay so now I'd sort of said you're in that second gowning area where you put this clean room suit on and now you go through a third air shower you open you go into the air shower you close and then you really shower off with air and then open and then you go into the main clean room which is shown here now that whole gowning process that is going to take about an hour no not an hour maybe that's going to take about 30 minutes and so you can imagine that if you work in there every day you've got to think about things like drinking coffee before you go in or you got to think about potty breaks because if it takes 30 minutes to gown and 30 minutes to ungown if you get in there in the middle of the morning and need to take a restroom bake it's going to take 30 minutes to ungown a few minutes in the restroom 30 minutes to gown up and come in you just shot your whole morning so typically <clears throat> I think typically you would uh, go in in the morning and then you would uh, come out at lunch and you could have lunch and have a break and then go back in uh, in the, uh, you know, after lunch. And then I think they have like longer shifts so that, again, you're not a person isn't spending all their working day gowning and ungowning. But you can imagine that's kind of something that you have to think about. You've got to think about potty breaks. And uh, here is just another picture inside of our Sandia National Laboratory's clean room. Again, you can see that she's wearing the full bubble suit and she has one of the wafers that is in fabrication. And she's in one of these rooms with the yellow light, meaning that is a photolithography room so that's one of the rooms that is doing the actual photolithography and so that is sort of how we got to the point that we can get 21 trillion operations a second off of an integrated circuit okay so let's see I'm trying to give you guys an idea you're sitting there hacking out code on these things and importing libraries and everything and a lot of you guys don't know anything at all about what's going on under the hood other than somehow all the stuff you're doing gets turned into zeros and one and then magic happens but it's just a bunch of black magic to you so I'm trying to take you kind of through what's going on under the hood so what did we learn last week last week what we learned is is that everything is based on zeros and ones and the way you do those zeros and ones is with tiny switches and those tiny switches are transistors and I showed you how a transistor actually worked last week the solid state physics behind how a transistor works if you haven't seen that go back to live shop talk number 30 I believe it was go back and watch that then today I showed you well how do we make the integrated circuit well it's all about building transistors on the same piece of silicon and it's about an 
uber clean environment so that you don't kill the transistors while you're making them. Now, if you are interested and you've got to kind of express interest here in the chat, I will be looking at the chat here. You guys have to express interest. Would you like me to kind of describe how it is now that the integrated circuit is built? You understand how a transistor works. You understand the clean room. But now, how do you actually take a blank wafer and end up with a transistor on it and more specifically on a wafer like this billions and billions of transistors what is that process and I could kind of take you through that now I told you that it was 400 steps but the good news is I don't have to describe 400 steps because it's kind of like you do the same thing over and over you deposit a thin film on the wafer you photo pattern it and then you etch that pattern in the layer that you deposited. Now you put another layer, you photo, you, you, you deposit a thin layer, you photo pattern etch. And so you build the, the integrated circuit, deposit photo pattern etch, deposit photo pattern etch, and you just repeat that over and over. And the 400 steps include steps like cleaning the wafer and then doing this, 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 this. It's very specific. So I don't have to teach you 400 steps, but I could sort of teach you that process flow and show show you how we could build up a transistor. Okay, well, let's see. We've got uh, Crazy Leon says he wants to see this. Okay, Ohio Tech Teen is enjoying it. I'm seeing some indication that, yes, you guys would be interested uh, in uh, why are there only integrate, why are there only transistors on the wafer? Because the only thing that a computer knows is zeros and ones, and the only way to get a zero and one is with a transistor. So what would you put on there besides a transistor if everything is zeros and ones, right? So it's, it's like a really good question, but I got to tell you, an integrated circuit is zeros and ones. There's no two, threes, and fours. It's zeros and ones, and everything that you do can be represented with a zero or a one. Okay, it looks like we've got some guys interested in this. How do they filter the air in the room? Well, it's just like imagine a paper filter. Okay, it's called a HEPA filter. And it's a filter that's very, very specifically designed. Paper is an oversimplification, but it's a very, very specific filter. And then it takes the particles out as it goes through. Now you could imagine, you couldn't just go in and throw the doors open. You've got to clean it. Like when you first turn the clean room on for the first time, it might take a month to get that air clean in there. And you might be changing those filters out because they can become loaded with dirty air. So once you get that clean room clean, you don't go in and open the doors. The only way in and the only way out are through those air locks so that it stays clean and you're only taking out the small new things that are end up in there from whatever. But anything that goes in has got to be super clean. Everything has got to go through the airlock. But it is just relatively sim simple HEPA filters, not totally unlike the filters that you might have in a home uh, uh, air purifier or air filter. The difference is, is that we have huge fans and we have huge filters because we've got to maintain very large airflow. Plus, we maintain laminar flow. Okay, won't the eddies, uh, won't there be eddies if the laminar flow hits an object? Okay, well, what you've got to do is you've kind of got to design it. You've got to design the objects to be consistent with the laminar flow and so the whole clean room design is very very specific and it's it's designed where you don't end up with those eddies that everything ends up laminar flow and everything ends up going down resistors take up a very large portion of the board okay you don't put resistors on an integrated circuit if you needed a resistor you would take a transistor and you would operate it in a certain way where it had a certain resistance but pretty much you don't have resistors on an integrated circuit pretty much much, and you don't have you do have capacitors so really an integrated circuit is primarily transistors and capacitors okay transistors and capacitors not really inductors not really resistors are all silicon wafers made of the same size and then cut up well there's industry standards like some number of years ago the industry standard was six inch and then as the technology advanced it went to eight inch 
and then it went to 12 inch and I would have to find like the state of the art the bleeding edge right now I don't know is it 15 inch 18 inch something like that but the bigger the wafer the more integrated circuits you can build at the same time that means the more you build at the same time the less each one costs so it is a game of cleaner rooms smaller transistors bigger wafers okay that is the game okay uh, ASCII is zero which is also decimal 97 okay uh, what's uh, okay uh, gallium nitride integrated circuits not sure on that a lot of the optical things like lasers are not uh, they are not silicon because silicon has an indirect band gap which means it can't emit light because it requires a conduction band to valence band transition requires a change of momentum and you can't change momentum with a photon so you cannot emit a photon out of silicon so you use things like gallium arsenide and some of the gallium compounds to make the uh, the optical type components Okay, the die size of a GPU is much larger than a CPU. Obviously, a CPU does not have a large amount of memory, but why is the smaller package preferred? <coughs> well, the bigger an integrated circuit is, the larger a specific integrated circuit is on a wafer, the greater the chance that you will have that random lucky dust particle, even in a clean room, that lands on it and kills it. So even today, you don't get 100% yield. Not every integrated circuit on the wafer is going to work because there is going to be that one particle that escaped the HEPA filter and lands on the wafer. And that one particle is going to make that, that transistor not work. And that is going to make that integrated circuit with 10 billion transistors not work. So when one transistor gets struck, you lose 10 billion <laughs> transistors. Can you believe that? This is a crazy thing that we're talking about. <coughs> are the integrated circuits on the edge of the wafer usually bad? Yes, sir, they are. They are usually bad. I don't know if you can see it, but can you see that some of them are actually partial? Okay, so if you think of a square chip, you think of a square chip on a round wafer, some of those chips on the edge don't even have a chance of working because they're not complete. And then the one closest to the edge aren't. And so you can see that this young lady is holding the wafer with tweezers. Anywhere the tweezers hit, of course, those aren't going to work. And it's just more likely around the edge. Everything is work worse around the edge. And so you typically end up with a sweet spot where most of the circuits are. And as you get closer to the edge, it's a lot harder to get those working. Hey, Austin Alban, how are you doing, buddy? One of my one of my former students there. What's Austin asking? Summit can process two hundred thousand. Uh, oh, Summit can process two hundred thousand trillions calculations per second. Austin, my friend, that is a lot of calculations. That is a mind blowing amount of cal uh, calculations. What do they use it for, Austin? Okay, what is a transistor made of? Transistor is made of silicon. Everything is made on a silicon wafer. And it, the transistor, the actual switch is down in the silicon. Now you put interconnecting, you put some other stuff on top of the silicon in thin layers, but the real magic happens in the silicon wafer. It happens in the silicon wafer. Maybe sh they should make wafers in a vacuum. Well, there's a lot of physics that goes into this. And I could tell you if you wanted another day how they make the wafer, I'll give you a hint. You start with sand. It's amazing. Silicon is the most abundant element on Earth. Like, what are the mo two most abundant elements on Earth? It's kind of like silicon, which you make integrated circuits out of, and carbon, which you make people out of. So I find that to be very interesting. Okay, uh, would printing the integrated circuits in a vacuum chamber or room be possible? Well, some of, a lot of the individual steps, you put the wafer in a vacuum chamber, okay, but you could not make a vacuum chamber out of the clean room. And even as we, more and more, we're trying to take people out of the clean room and we're trying to have robots in there because a robot can live in there and a robot can be cleaner. But, but even if you had only robots in there, you can't have 
something that is hundreds of thousands of square feet and make it a vacuum. You just you just can't do that. But a lot of the individual steps, the machines themselves are vacuum chambers. So they go in and the individual step itself is done in a vacuum chamber. Sorry to ask again, what should I study to learn more about LEDs and CMOS transistor physics? It is called solid state physics. Electrical engineering with an emphasis on solid state physics. There is a wonderful book by Ben Streetman called Semiconductor Devices. Look it up on Amazon. It is a really good book. It'll give you an idea how diodes and transistors actually work. Are the transistors represented by logic diagrams to execute tasks? Well, <coughs> no. You might need four or five or eight transistors to make a logic gate. So when you see an AND gate or an OR gate on a schematic, that is not a transistor. That would be underneath if you peeled it back and looked you might have seven or eight transistors in there how do they clean the room well i told you that oh well it's just the air is clean and i really don't know if you have like a cleaning lady with a spray bottle type of thing you don't see too much of that you don't see too much of that it's more about keeping the air clean and things don't get dirty because you see you've got gloves on, you're all hooded up, and so you're kind of in a pristine environment. Removing the air wouldn't necessarily remove the particles. That is true, Mr. Edward Hogan. That is true. If silicon is so abundant, what makes them so small? Why make them so small? Well, my friend, if you have a billion of them and you made them larger, your integrated circuit would be the size of a football field, right? Like, I'm just going to make something up. If the transistor was the size of a grain of rice, the integrated circuit would be the size of a football field. Not going to be a very convenient cell phone, I must say. And so also these wafers are really expensive. So like for me to put a batch of 20 of these wafers through my fabrication facility, it would cost $250,000. $250,000. $250,000. So number one, when you come up with that list of 400 steps, you want to make sure that you don't make a mistake. Now in high school or college, when your math is right 90% of the time, you're a hero. You get an A. But if you're doing math to make an integrated circuit and you're right 90% of the time, they fire you. Bye-bye. Also, the people that are working in the fab... <clears throat> They're not necessarily the physicists. They're, they look on the run sheet. The computer tells them the next step. They take the wafers, put it in the machine, type in the next step. Now, they are really highly expert people, but they are following the instructions that you put in the, you know, in the machine. So the person that comes up with that run sheet has got to do it right. But you can imagine this person with the wafer that, like, she's got that wafer she's putting in the machine. If she drops it, that would be like wrecking a Corvette. She just lost a cor Corvette. If she dropped the box of wafers with the 20, that would be like you just burned down your house. So the people who work in there have to be really, really careful. And typically kind of like the first time they make a mistake, you give them a warning and you just let them know how important it is for them to be very, very careful. The second mistake, it's kind of like, a formal write-up and kind of a probation and then the third mistake you would lose you would have to get rid of them because you can imagine if a box of wafers costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars you can't just be going around and every day four or five people dropping a box of wafers okay what are the different types of machines used to print the circuits printing the circuit is not the right way of thinking of it you build the circuit the circuit like the switching is happening by physics down in the silicon wafer. And so there are machines that will deposit thin layers. There are machines that will photo pattern thin layers. And there are machines that will etch the thin layers. Etching is typically done with ions. It's done with plasmas. Uh, the depositions are done with plasmas. Ch chemical vapor deposition ion etching you're etching with ions and plasmas and you're depositing with ions and plasma a lot of crazy physics going on there so 
do we have many companies making these wafers or only a handful? <coughs> well, you got to think, what do you mean by making the wafers? There's not a lot of companies that make the bare starting material. So you buy the blank wafers and then there's lots of different companies that have the integrated circuit manufacturing facilities. But a lot of times... If you're an IC company, you might be a design house and you might just design the circuit and then you might send your design to a fabrication facility and that fabrication facility is just a facility for hire. You send them your designs and they make your integrated circuits for them. Then some places are more vertically, uh, vertically integrated like Intel would do the design. They would do the manufacture of the of, of the chips. They would do the packaging, the testing, the putting in a package of the motherboards. You see, they're very vertically integrated. And other people who are just getting started, maybe they're just a design house. Okay, guys, this has been a lot of fun, but we've gone about 13 minutes over. And so I'm going to wrap this thing up. But if you guys are interested, leave me a comment. Okay, leave me a comment and we'll try to do this again next week if this is a topic that interests you. It's something you don't see a lot. And, you know, like I was a guy in there developing a lot of this technology, so I kind of know what's going on. We could have another one of these next week if you are interested. Hey, want to give a shout out to you guys who are helping me out over at Patreon. I really appreciate it. It is your generosity and encouragement that keeps this great content coming. also appreciate you guys uh, that are helping out in other ways. And and uh, if you like this, think about giving us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. When you subscribe, make sure that you ring that bell. And then also think about sharing this on social media with other people that might be interested in it. So I'm going to let you guys go at this point. Paul McWhorter from TopTechBoy.com. I will talk to you guys later.